Hi, my name is Brianna Woods. Um, I first came to New Story, um, never once saw a sermon online, just kind of discovered you guys on, on your website. And since then, I've been baptized, and it's been nothing but a great experience ever since. Okay, so today's passage is from Lamentations chapter 2, and I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 5 and 17 through 20. How the Lord has covered the daughter of Zion with the cloud of his anger. He has hurled down the splendor of Israel from heaven to earth. He has not remembered his footstool in the day of his anger. Without pity, the Lord has swallowed up all the dwellings of Jacob. In his wrath, he has torn down the strongholds of the daughter of Judah. He has brought her kingdom and its princes down to the ground in dishonor. In fierce anger, he has cut off every horn of Israel. He has withdrawn his right hand at the approach of the enemy. He has burned in Jacob like a flaming fire that consumes everything around it. Like an enemy, he has strung his bow, his right hand is ready. Like a foe, he has slain all who were pleasing to the eye. He has poured out his wrath like fire on the tent of the daughter of Zion. The Lord is like an enemy. The Lord has done what he planned. He has fulfilled his word, which he decreed long ago. He has overthrown you without pity. He has let the enemy gloat over you. He has exalted the horn of your foes. The hearts of the people cry out to the Lord. O wall of the daughter of Zion, let your tears flow like a river day and night. Give yourself no relief, your eyes no rest. Arise, cry out in the night as the watches of the night begin. Pour out your heart like water in the presence of the Lord. Lift up your hands to him for the lives of your children who faint from hunger at the head of every street. Look, O Lord, and consider whom have you ever treated like this? This is the word of the Lord. Can we thank Brianna? Lord. Thank you. So good. You got a proud husband there, video recording everything. <laughs> so good. Such a powerful passage. Can we just thank Brianna one more time for sharing God's word with us? So good. Well, good morning to you. Hello, friends. Welcome to New Story Church, especially those of you online as well. We want to say hello to you. Uh, on your way in, you probably received some of, the, some of these, at least uh, one of these. You should have a rock in your hand. Uh, do not throw these at me, okay? If you don't like the message, you're falling asleep, it's, that's on you, not me. Anyways, no, I'm just kidding. If you don't have a rock in your hand, go ahead and raise your hand, and Pastor David maybe will come and throw one at you. I don't, I don't know what the deal is, but we'll have some... Uh, uh, some, some ushers come forward. Uh, you need at least one in your hand. If you're watching online right now, I, I don't know what to say. Uh, oh, maybe you have a pile of rocks at home or something. Uh, get a blunt object. You're going to need something uh, because here's the deal. Uh, we are stepping into part two of our Lamentation series, and we're going to pick up from actually where we left off last week. And last week, uh, we were in chapter one. The last verse of uh, chapter one, verse 22, says this. Uh, my groans are many, and my heart is faint. My groans are many, and my heart is faint. These are very heavy words from a severely broken heart, right? I mean, more specifically, we saw how historically and even contextually the people of God at that point in Lamentations 1, they had lost their homes, right? They, they lost their city. They lost the, the temple where they worshiped, their very identity. They lost Jerusalem. Jerusalem uh, was in bad shape, right? We saw how they had experienced economic collapse, financial ruin. And how, because of a number of these things, they were experiencing relational and even identity strains as well. Which, contextually speaking, is relatable for many of us today, uh, as we've also been facing similar challenges, right? Physical, financial, relational, social, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, over these last 18 months, and even beyond, right? It doesn't have to be limited to these last 18 months. But we've all experienced these things, either on a global or individual scale. 
scale, probably somewhere in between. Uh, in between. So again, my groans are many and my heart is faint. This is why a series like this is so important. Because the deeper you want to go in your spiritual formation, well then, the more you must have a grasp and an understanding of the theology of pain and the spiritual discipline of lament. Do you want to grow deeper in your spiritual formation? You must learn lament. You must have a theology of pain. I want you to think of it this way. You can jot this down. You cannot appreciate the power of resurrection without the reality of the cross. You can't appreciate the power of resurrection without the reality of the cross. No cross, no new life. Okay, so, so now with that in mind, what's, what's with these rocks, right? Well, just for our time today, it, it, these rocks, or the rock you have in your hand, some of you took a couple, right? These rocks serve as a tangible reminder, a kinetic, physical, tangible reminder of the internal pains that are easier for you to hide right now. This is a physical reminder, a visible reminder of something that's easy for you to hide and bury and not show to others, this is a little bit harder to ignore. See, just as you can't pretend this doesn't exist, just as you can't ignore the reality of this rock in your hands, I want to challenge us to be honest for a moment before God with our pain, our struggles, our regrets, our hurts this morning. We just can't pretend that they don't exist. The church, our church, is a hospital for the sick, not a museum for perfect lives and perfect pictures. There is no lament and progress forward without acknowledgement. For my groans are many, and my heart is faint. You lose the emotional connection with that. You, you, you don't understand this book. You don't understand this word of God. So I would ask you this morning, rock in hand, what does this represent? What does this symbolize for you today? Is this a relational strain? Maybe, maybe this is something like mental health related for you. Perhaps this is a financial challenge. Maybe you're grieving a, a loved one lost or, or, or something went wrong in school or in the home or, or, or the marriage is suffering. What does this represent for you? Because I tell you what, you don't have to share it with a neighbor. I'm not going to ask you to tell your neighbor what this rock represents for you this morning. No, this is between you and God. So I don't need to know and your neighbor doesn't need to know this morning. But I would ask you to please put a name on it. Identify what do these rocks mean for you this morning? You know, a friend of mine reached out to me the other day and he's given me permission to share. I'd never share anything like this unless I was given permission. But he gave me permission because he knew it would help others. Long story short, his marriage of nearly 20 years has come to an abrupt end. It's over. 20 years of marriage, they have two older kids. Now you talk about some heavy rocks, some real rocks. I mean, he has to still go to work the next day, right? Pretend they don't exist, but he still has to carry that with him every day. Not only him, but his ex and his two kids as well. Likewise, again, with the permission to share, a woman came to me recently in tears after one of our services, lamenting, sharing, grieving with me. Pastor Tom, I just, they had had a miscarriage. 
And they were told that they, they could not have a baby. And this was months before, but it was only recently that it dawned on her that she was able to actually lament and process with her husband. And she realized months later after the miscarriage, oh my gosh, we, we, we can't have kids anymore. This is an end to a childhood dream of mine. That's a heavy lament. Her dream is over. So friends, we are given the permission, the invitation to bring our rocks, whatever they want, to the man of sorrows that Pastor Nathan shared with us in Isaiah. A man of sorrows acquainted with grief. We, we are given the invitation to bring these rocks to the one who describes himself as gentle and lowly in heart. We have a Lord who knows lament. So I would ask you this morning, what do these rocks represent for you? Be honest. Look at it, feel it. Just everyone, just grab, grab your rock, hold it real tight, grip it real tight, and give it a name right now. Give it a name. What does it represent for you? We can't go further until you identify it. What does it represent for you? Because now with that in mind and rocks literally in hand, let's turn the corner and look to our passage today that Brianna read, Lamentations chapter 2. See, what we have to understand is, whereas the first chapter last week, and if you missed last week, you got to go back. You just got to go back. You got to catch up and, and, and don't, miss, don't, don't miss the series, right? Catch up to the series. But last week in the first chapter, it was all about the voices of people suffering, right? Uh, Israel was personified as the queen, or in some translations, the princess, and she had been reduced to what now? A slave, uh, the people of God were, were personified as a whole, as, as an affluent people, a rich people, a, a, a people that were a bountiful in blessings, uh, but then suddenly they were now personified as what in chapter one? A widow, someone without a breadwinner in a patriarchal society, completely destitute, right? Many are the groans and the faint heart of his people, but chapter two Chapter 2 today, Lamentations chapter 2, is all about God emerging as the main subject. God emerges as the main subject. All, chapter 1 is all about us and our pain, but chapter 2 is all about God emerging as the main subject. In fact, I want you to notice how many times God is referenced in those first five verses that Brianna read for us, how many times he's actually referenced. Verse 1, it starts out, how the Lord has covered the daughter of Zion with clouds. Right? The Lord, look at all these pronouns. I'm bringing out my lightsaber, okay? The Lord, he his pronoun, he is all referring to the Lord. He, his, his, the Lord, he, he. Next slide, next verse here, chapter three, verse three. He, his, he, 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 his, his, he, 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 his, the Lord, right? It's all about the Lord. Literally, if you were to count, and I did, over 20 times in the first five verses alone, and that ratio continues throughout the chapter, God is clearly abundantly identified as the subject of this chapter. It's not about your pains anymore. Now it's about God. We went through your pains in chapter one. Now we're talking about God. God gets the spotlight here. But now let me ask you, over 20 times in five verses, let me ask you now, are you picking up positive vibes about God in these first five verses? Is this like the happy-go-lucky God? The God we all love and want to snuggle up with? Is this that God? Are you picking up positive vibes? Like is God in a good mood <laughs> in these first five verses? No. No, 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 no. God is not happy. Uh, to use the language of our day, we would say God looks triggered. <laughs> He's triggered in these first five verses. But don't take my word for it again. Look at what it says. 
How the Lord has covered the daughter of Zion with the cloud of his what? Anger. Listen to, listen to the anger language. Listen to the triggering language here, okay? He has hurled down his anger. Without pity, the Lord has swallowed up his wrath. He has torn down. He has brought her kingdom and his princes down to the ground in dishonor. Next verse. He has cut off. This is anger language. This is trigger language. He has withdrawn his right hand. He has burned. He has strung his bow. His right hand is ready to strike like a foe he has slain. He has poured out his wrath like fire. This is trigger language, right? And just in case, just in case somehow you're asleep right now, in case you need the Cliff Notes version, in case you need a summary of how if just God is feeling right now check this out verse 5 it says the Lord is like and what enemy question have you ever felt like God was your enemy That's a scary place. I'm not talking about Abba, Father God. I'm not talking about agape, unconditional loving God. I'm not talking about the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I'm talking about the Lord is your enemy. Because that's what the verse says. The Lord is like an enemy. So I'm asking you, have you ever felt like the Lord was your enemy? Like, like, like there's nothing you can do. It's like constantly there's a roadblock, there's a, there's a blockage, there's a, a challenge, there's an obstacle. And, and in his hand, it feels against you like you can't catch a break. Has your heart ever whispered? Has your heart ever doubted? The Lord is against me. He's my enemy. He doesn't love me. He doesn't like me. He is against me, not for me. Because if you've been there, you are not alone. And that is a legitimate feeling. That's real. And you can be real with God. He can take it. And you can be real with his word. His word can take it. So if you've been in that real place, you need to know that's legit. But what you also need to know is that God's display of anger here, it's also legit. It's coming from a legitimate place. This is not like your father, the alcoholic, and you're afraid for him to come home because he's going to beat you. This is not that God. This is not that father. Is he angry? Yes. Is it legit? Absolutely. So where does this legitimacy come from? Well, again, just like last week, we need to look historically and contextually. Historically and contextually speaking, it's coming way back. Here we are. We're in Lamentations chapter 2. But, but where this anger is legitimately coming from is way before... Lamentations chapter 2, hundreds of pages before and hundreds of years earlier to Deuteronomy chapter 28. If you look in your Bible at Deuteronomy 28, hundreds of pages er earlier and representing hundreds of years earlier, okay? And in Deuteronomy 28, what's happening there is this. See, in Deuteronomy 28, Moses, right, the leader of God's people, everyone knows Moses, right, Charlton Heston, he comes out, okay, and Israel, the people of God, have been enslaved for years and years in Egypt, and they're finally free. They're finally free from enslavement, and they're going, to, they're headed to the promised land. This is the good place, right? But they get lost. They wander for 40 years. So they spent generations in enslavement, and they're spending generations in the wilderness. And finally, finally, on Deuteronomy 28, they're on the cusp of entering the new promised land. 
And so what Moses does is Moses is about to give them some new ground rules, some new house rules. This is a new chapter in our lives. We're no longer wandering. We're no longer slaves. So what we're going to do is we got some new rules to play with here. And he lays out the blessings and curses of the covenant that they are about to renew. In other words, Moses reminds the people of God as they were entering the promised land, as they were about to enter this new life, he says basically this. He says, do this, obey, and you will be blessed. You'll have lots of children. They'll grow up happy and strong. Your marriages will thrive. Your land will overproduce to the point of abundance and overflow. Your enemies will not prosper over you. Just do this. Just trust and obey God and you will be blessed. But there's a flip side to that coin. The flip side is if you disobey, you won't be blessed. You'll be cursed. And the, the remainder of the chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 28, it says, however, verse 15, however, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees I am giving you today, all these curses will come on you and overtake you. Verse 16, you will be cursed in the city and cursed in the country. Your basket and your kneading trough will be cursed. The fruit of your womb will be cursed and the crops of your land and the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks. You will be cursed when you come in and cursed when you go out. The, whole, the remainder of the whole, whole chapter, the whole chapter, chapter all these next verse dozens and dozens more verses talk about how you will be cursed so now let me ask you how do you think the people of God responded they had one job they had one job right do you think that they obeyed or disobeyed one job let me hear you what do you think they did disobeyed yeah they did like all of us would do. Eventually, all of us would also disobey. And they, that's what they did. Over and over again, they disobeyed. As a matter of fact, I would just say it like this. Here we are in Deuteronomy 28 to Lamentations chapter 2. Actually, if we want to be technical, if we want to be technical, even before Deuteronomy 28, I would go even all the way down to Genesis chapter 2. I would go to Gen Genesis 3. Genesis 3 to Lamentations. That's like a good, this is, this is physically, literally how much of the Bible, right? That's the majority of the Old Testament. All this right here, it, you know what this is? All all of this is literally God saying, I love you. Now trust and obey me, but God's people disobeying. I love you. Now trust and obey me, but God's people disobeying. I love you. Now trust me, but God's people disobeying. I love you. Now trust me, but God's people disobeying. That's literally what these pages are. You should still read your Bible, but that's literally what these pages say over and over again. From Genesis 3, technically we're talking about Deuteronomy 28 all the way to Lamentations chapter 2. I love you. Now trust me and obey. But the people disobeyed. Now, with that in mind, we finally come to Lamentations chapter 2. And because God is a God who is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? Because God is a faithful God. He actually, in Lamentations 2, he finally, we're starting to see now, he finally actually delivers on his promise from Deuteronomy 28. He finally now, after all these years and generations, exercises correction and curses for the first time, which means this is why Lamentations 2 right now, we see a city of God's people absolutely <laughs> reduced to rubble and in lament. That's what we're seeing now in Lamentations 2. See, friends, it's not that God was throwing a temper tantrum. God is not that alcoholic father who's angry about something at work. No, instead, what we're experiencing here in Lamentations 2 is a very long, classic, 
this is gonna hurt me more than it hurts you, daddy move. That's what Lamentations 2 is. It's a long overdue daddy move. Which is, why, by the way, why verse 17 reads, the Lord has done what he planned. <laughs> he has fulfilled his word, which he decreed long ago. Do you see that? And then after, after this, like the reminder, oh, hey, by the way, he promised this hundreds of years ago, kept on saying it, kept on forgiving you, kept on forgiving you, kept on forgiving you. And so now, let me remind you, this is something that he said long ago. And then we have the rage. And then we have the anger. So do you see how God is only doing what he said he would do? And even that, was after years and years and years of patience and mercy and compassion. See, for God to do anything less would have been a lie. God doesn't lie. He doesn't lie. But this is also where it gets tricky, yeah? This is where it gets tricky because on the one hand, like the one verse that everyone knows, even non-believers, is God is love. First John 4, 16. God is love. God is love. But what about like Deuteronomy and, and Hebrews where it says, God's a consuming fire. <laughs> and by the way, that's not like a warm, cuddly fire you snuggle up with your loved one. with. Consu <laughs> That's like a, a jealous, incinerating fire that burns, and it incinerates anything of idolatry where people would not trust him. So what do you do with that? God is love. God is a consuming fire. What do you do with that? See, what do you do when you're struck with, uh, between love and holiness? What do you do when you're in the middle of, of mercy and justice? See, the book of Lamentations, if it does nothing else, the book of Lamentations, just like real life, forces us to ask better and deeper questions. So what do you do with a God who is love and at the same time a God who is a consuming fire? Well, I'll tell you one thing. Our track record doesn't speak very highly, okay? Uh, sociologically, culturally, historically, right? Our track record says that we, we, we don't know how to marinate in both at the same time. Uh, Tim Keller in his book, The Prodigal Prophet, puts it this way. Many people in the modern West don't accept the idea of a God who judges. They want a God of love. But a God of love who does not get angry when evil destroys the creation he loves is ultimately not a loving God at all. If you love someone, you must and will get angry if something threatens to destroy him or her. Can I get an amen from the parents in the house? If you love someone, you must. It's an imperative. You must. It's a declarative. If you love someone, you must and will get angry. If something threatens to destroy him or her, and then I, I, I just love how this part ends. He says, as someone pointed out, you had to have had a pretty comfortable life <laughs> without any experience of oppression and injustice yourself to not want a God who punishes sin. I think he put Karen in parentheses there. Just... And so here we are, right? Here we are. Is God loving and good? Does he care for your pains? Yes. Look at the cross. But then, is God holy and righteous? Does he hate sin and does he punish sin? Yes. Look at the cross. See, friends, 
if, if, you, if you get nothing from our time spent today, I, I want you to see and understand what, what I love most about this passage. What I love most about our passage today is <clears throat> after being assured that the Lord uh, does as he plans, right? The, this first sentence here, the Lord does what he plans. He has fulfilled his word, et cetera, et cetera. After being assured and reminded that the Lord is only doing what he said he would do over and over again, right? And that that's why he was angry. And that that's why he showed all this rage without pity and, and let the enemy gloat and, and the tears flow and no signs of relief or rest were inside. It, it's only because it was a fulfillment of his word and all these things happened. Did you notice the last sentence there? It's, it's on the sc screen there. The, lament, the lamenter pleads, look, Lord, and consider, whom have you ever treated like this? It's like all this pain is happening, all this rage. God is so triggered. And it's like, God, God, you don't ever treat anyone. Why are you treating me like this? You're like, you're like an enemy to me. Whom have you ever treated like this? And friends, what is the answer to that desperate question? I would ask you this morning, well, whom else has the Lord treated in this way? Is your memory starting to think fulfilling? Who else, think about this, who else has God treated this way, fulfilling his word to creed long ago, seemingly without pity, while the enemy would sit there and gloat as tears flows like blood and the, the person cries out, uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Whom else has God the Father treated Treated this way? Was it only these Jews in Jerusalem? Was it only you right now as you feel there licking your wounds and feeling sorry for yourself and saying, oh my gosh, God, you're like an enemy to me? Was it only you? Was it only the Jews? No. Whom else did God the Father treat this way? The answer is his only son, Jesus Christ. That's whom he treated this way, only worse. Because you and I at least have breath of life. You and I can still lament. God treated his own son this way. See, if nothing else, the cross shows us all, even if we don't see it in the moment, that in the hands of a good God, or in the hands of a good and just God, there is always greater purpose for the pain. That's what the cross reminds us of. That there's always a greater purpose to the pain, always. But I want to share with you in our remaining time two things that the enemy will try to steal, kill, and destroy to prevent you from embracing the truth that there's purpose to whatever pain you're going through. I wanna share with you two things. I see some of you already taking notes and you've been taking notes and that's great. Uh, the first thing that the enemy will use as a weapon against you so that you do not embrace this truth is number one, the sheer torment of pain. The sheer torment of pain. Sometimes the pain is so unbearable, it is so raw, we feel like we cannot even breathe, we cannot even deal with anything else. We can't hold uh, one single more thought. Uh, like for my friend who, who just got divorced. He and his former wife, you need to know, <laughs> they're believers, they are God-fearing, Jesus-loving believers. As a matter of fact, both he and his wife were in full-time ministry. Okay? So it's not like they didn't know. It's not like they didn't know or understand this whole Christian thing, this whole Jesus thing. It's just that the sheer torment of pain clouded everything so much. It, it pushed everything out. Nothing else mattered to them other than somehow relieving the torment of their immediate pain. They felt like they were suffocating and drowning. And it had to like come up for air. And this is what they thought was the best way. And I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying what it is. That's the pain that they were in. Sometimes the enemy will use the sheer torment of pain to goad you 
to pry you, to have you focused on that pain instead of on the cross and the pain of the cross and the pain that Jesus endured. Do you know that the first time we see a stone in the gospel of Mark, do you know that it is also in the hands of a man who would torment himself with pain? Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, it says, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. See, I know that some of you are in a similar spot today. I don't even want to look up because I don't want to make eye contact. Oh, he's talking about me. I know that some of you are in a similar spot today. And the sheer torment of the pain is just, it's too raw and unbearable right now. Maybe you're someone here, maybe you're someone watching online and you've lost a loved one. You're experiencing the death of a marriage. Your kids are out of control. And maybe you're fighting the never-ending battle of a physical ailment. The sheer torment of pain is blinding. It's suffocating. And you need relief now. So I want to assure you now. Your Lord who knows how to lament says, come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, another word is tormented. And I will give you rest. That's a promise. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Right now, right now, you turn to Jesus. You will find rest. There's a second weapon the enemy tries to use to smother our hope in the midst of pain, and that is, number two, the fear of judgment. Mm, mm -mm. The fear of judgment. See, deep down inside, there are some of you here today, you actually feel, I don't know who whispered this, I do know, but you actually feel as though you actually deserve the pain that you're feeling right now because of the wrong that you've done in the past, right? And so when we, when we cast judgment on ourself, it's like every bad thing that it happens, we start to interpret it, we start to look at it through the eyes, through that particular lens of judgment. And that's how we interpret, or shall I say, misinterpret everything around us, Right? And so you, you, got, you got students that say, oh, you know, I failed that test because I didn't go to church. No, fool, you failed that test because you didn't study. All right, that's not, that's not God's judge. No. But on a more serious note, right, this is why you have married couples that come and say, oh, you know, they, they think that they lost their baby because maybe they weren't tithing. I want to tell you as a pastor, okay, that's not true. That's a lie. That's a lie straight from the pit of hell, straight from the one who's called the accuser and the father of lies. See, Jesus Christ, he took away all that judgment. The father of lies and the accuser, he wants to throw, he wants to cast stones at you in judgment and in condemnation. But scripture says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? See, friends, whether, I don't know what, what this stone represents for you today. But whether you've come into this place, you're carrying that stone Chances are it represents one of these two things. It either represents torment and the sheer pain of things. 
and, and you, you can't even concentrate. You know, on a lesser extent, I had like a root canal a couple of weeks ago and like the, I had an exposed nerve and like I lit, my, my, pain, my head was throbbing, my ears were throbbing and I couldn't focus on anything just because of the, the sheer pain and the torment. Some of you, your pain, your rock, it represents judgment that you cast on yourself. Let alone the judgment you might feel from others. So here's what we're gonna do. In these last few moments of worship, as we present our tithes and offerings to him, you can do that through the QR code. Many of you automatically give. That's what our family does. We automatically give online. But anyways, band's gonna lead us in a couple of songs. And as they do, I wanna invite you in your own sweet time during these next two songs to identify this stone, what it means for you, either uh, of judgment or of torment, maybe both, And right here, in this sacred space, let's not carry them out any further. Let's let's put them at the altar. Let's lay them at Jesus' feet. Don't take any of these home with you today. Don't do that. Let this be a symbolic step of faith between you and God. You don't have to tell anyone. This is a symbolic step of faith, a spiritual step of faith between you and God. And you're saying, I want to lay down my stones here. Just like the religious leaders who were ready to cast stones at a woman caught in adultery. But after a face-to-face encounter with Jesus himself, they had no choice but to drop all their stones and walk away with not one more ounce of judgment or torment. I want to invite you to that place right now. Would that be okay? Don't carry the torment or judgment any further. Let's take a step of faith today, a symbolic step of faith in our spiritual formation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we come to you now and... I really, I don't know what kind of stones we have in our hands right now. What kind of rocks and how we cast stones at others and and cut ourselves with them as well, judgment or torment. But I know, Father, that a true encounter with you, it causes us to drop them. It causes us to leave them at your feet like the religious leaders, like the man in the grave. Help us to drop our stones. I pray against the cynical heart right now, the calloused heart that says, well, this one act isn't going to do anything. God, may it be the start of something new. God, by the power of your word, through the presence of your Holy Spirit, within the community of your saints, I pray that you would continue to do a good work in us. Your word says that you will finish onto completion the good work that you have begun in us. Would you begin a good work in us today as we learn how to lament, as we learn how to be honest and real before you. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. Let's continue to worship.